everybody here today. I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. I didn't mention this in the announcements. I probably should have, but I've already... Some of you have asked about my family, where they are. Uh, they went to Scotts Hill this morning. Uh, Sarah's dad used to preach at Scotts Hill a long time ago, and they were having a homecoming service today, and they haven't seen some of those people in probably close to 15 years. And so they all went as a group together uh, to worship with them and see some people they haven't seen in quite a long time. And so that's where my family is. But I appreciate you asking about them, and I'll be sure to tell Sarah that you did so. Uh, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We are continuing our study on the Ten Commandments. Uh, and uh, what we're going to be talking about today is the commandment related to essentially family. I think a lot of times we, uh, we look at only children as it's related to this commandment, but I believe, I believe it's a lot more broad than that. It's a lot more important than that. It's not just about the children. It's about the family as a whole, the household as a whole. And so as I want to uh, begin this lesson, we're going to look at some of the things that we have, or actually all of the things that we have been talking about in recent weeks. Uh, we talked first of all about the background. The background of the Ten Commandments was the fact that there are some changes that have taken place. The Ten Commandments are given both in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Forty years separate those two chapters. And so we're talking about a completely different group of people in Deuteronomy than we are Exodus chapter 20. And so that's a significant thing. There was a change in circumstances, there was a change in audience, and there was a change in tone from Exodus 20 to Deuteronomy 5. The second lesson highlighted the backbone of the Ten Commandments. The backbone of the Ten Commandments is basically the verse right before we start listing the Ten Commandments. Uh, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, God told the people of Israel. And so we learn some things about God. We learn that He's personal. We learn that He is powerful. And we learn that He is passable. And so that's kind of the backbone. Why are the Ten Commandments important? Why should we or the people of Israel, anybody reading them, why should we perk up and listen? Why should we obey those things? Because of Exodus 20 and verse 2 and Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 6 because God led them out of Egyptian bondage. And symbolically, He has done the same thing for us. He is our God just as much as He is Israel's God. And then we began talking about the Ten Commandments themselves. We looked at two commandments. The first two are related to the concept of monotheism. The first commandment is about who you ought to worship. You worship the Lord God only. One singular God. That's what Israel, that's the one that Israel was supposed to worship. But in the second commandment, also related to monotheism, was the fact that how do we worship? In what way are we supposed to worship? Well, you worship according to the commandments and the way that God has authorized in His law. If Israel worshiped in any other way, then they were going beyond what was written. And the application that we draw from that is the exact same thing. If we worship in any way that's not authorized in the New Testament, we're going beyond what is written. And we're adding to the Word of God, and we are not adhering to God's commandments. And so that covered the first couple of commandments. In commandment number three, we talked about faithfulness. This is where uh, it said, do not take the Lord your God's name in vain. I take a, a lot of times we take that commandment and we only apply it to our speech. How do we mention God's name in a sentence? But the commandment is so much more involved in that. It involves everything about the faithfulness that it takes being God's people. We are to be faithful to God in every aspect of our lives, not just in the things that we say, but in the things that we do as well. And then the last commandment that we talked about was commandment number four, which is the commandment about the Sabbath and the rest that God provides His people. We do not observe the Sabbath the way that they did in the Old Testament. And the reason for that is very simple. In the Old Testament, the Sabbath commandment was theological, not ethical. 
All the other commandments are ethical in nature, and thus we, not only can we find them in the New Testament, just like we find them in the Old Testament, but we have to adhere to the principles that are given the exact same way that the Israelites did. The reason for that is because they are ethical, not doctrinal. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 17 Paul said, don't give attention to Sabbaths, new moons, and feast days, things of that nature, because those things were a shadow of the things that were to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Why do we not worship Sabbaths anymore? Because the whole idea of the rest that was involved in the Sabbath commandment, Jesus fulfilled that. He has provided us the rest that we need, not a physical rest, but a spiritual rest. And so we still do have a rest in the church today. It's just not doctrinal the way that it was in the Old Testament. And so we do not adhere to that commandment in the same way. So today, we're going to talk about family. Um, I mentioned earlier, for you to turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, we will look at Deuteronomy chapter 5 and the passage there here in just a minute. But it says in verse 12, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The first thing that I want us to recognize about this commandment is that we have a, a very high regard, a very, very much an importance of family being described here. Family is important for all the generations, and we'll kind of harp on that as we go along through the lesson this morning. But I want to begin by thinking about the Old Testament. How is family so important in the Old Testament? Well, let's turn to Leviticus chapter 21, and let's look at some things. Leviticus chapter 21. Before I read these verses, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. But before I read those verses, I want us to, to think about what it means to be clean. We do a lot of things to make sure that we are clean, don't we? We want to take care of ourselves. I don't want to stink when I go out in public. I don't want to be dirty when I go out in public. Uh, let's say I go to church on Sunday morning. If I'm dirty, does that present the type of, uh, of, uh, of physical description of who I'm supposed to be towards God and worship to Him? I mean, we see this in the Old Testament and other places as well. Uh, back in Exodus chapter 19, right before the Ten Commandments were given, God told the people of Israel, prepare yourselves because in three days you are going to come at the foot of the mountain and I'm going to say some things to you that are important. The Ten Commandments are some of those things that follows. But one of the things we read about them doing is they washed their clothes. They prepared themselves to come to the foot of the mountain. And one of those things was making sure that they were, uh, that they were clean. And so cleanliness is a very important thing. We do this very much so today. But in the Old Testament, cleanliness is a representation of something that's a little bit different. We're talking about ceremonial cleanliness. We're talking about purity. We are talking about holiness. When it comes to the law of Moses, cleanliness is used most often in that type of way. And so having discussed some things about cleanliness, both in the, the physical aspects of things, but more importantly, I want you to get in your mind the spiritual aspect of cleanliness. Was it important in the Old Testament? You better believe it was. If you were spiritually clean or ritually clean, you were in God's sight. You were good in God's sight. You were in His fellowship. If you were not, you were excluded from the fellowship of God and the fellowship of His people. With that in mind, do we ever want to be unclean spiritually? We don't. But look at Leviticus 21, 1 through 3. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, No one shall make himself unclean for the dead among his people, except for his close relatives, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, or his virgin sister who is near to him because she has no husband. For her, he may make himself unclean. 
If I were to ask you this question before we read this, is there ever a time in the, uh, the Old Testament where the people of Israel, it was okay to be unclean? Chances are you would have said, no, not at all. Cleanliness is everything to the people of Israel. But here's an exception. An exception that's related to what? Family. Priests, you can make yourselves unclean for the sake of your family. Is family important in the Old Testament? You better believe it. We're going to look at a passage in Ephesians 6 here in just a little bit that puts forth the idea that, yes, it's important in the New Testament as well. But family is very important. And so as we think about this concept of family and the importance of family, we need to recognize, first of all, that we cannot minimize the importance of family. Family is very essential. It's for some reason, we don't see family reunions as often as we used to. The last time I was at a family reunion, you know what I remember about it? I was a little bitty kid, and the only thing I remember about that family reunion is getting stung by a bee. I don't remember any of the fellowship that I have with my family members. All I remember is I got stung by a bee playing basketball, and it hurt. Why is that family reunion not more important to me? I'm glad that some of us, some of us here today and others that we may know of, do still engage in family reunions. It's a good thing because it shows that family is important. It doesn't need to be minimized. Well, God wanted people to understand this in Scripture, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. That family is important. The importance does not need to be minimized. But also when we think about family, we need to recognize that it gives a place of belonging and a place of sharing. And so it's not just about belonging. Well, I'm part of this family and I'm not part of this family. I belong to this group and I don't belong to this group. That's true, but it's so much more than that. We get to share something with a group of people that we don't really get to share in any other group. If you'll go back quickly to Genesis chapter 2, these verses many of us are probably familiar with, chapter 2 of Genesis and verse 18. It says this, The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. That's what the ESV says. It says, fit for him. Some translations say, uh, comparable to or uh, compatible or something like that. Here's, the fa here's what's, what's being communicated here. When Adam was alone, God said, it's not good for Adam to be alone. But not only does he need a woman, he needs somebody that fits him. He needs somebody that he can share his life with that's going to be there and they're going to have a good relationship and they're going to be comparable to each other. See, sometimes we, we may date people or we may have relationships with people, but we just don't compare to that person. We just Maybe we're too different in some, some respects. We are too alike each other and it just won't work. But Adam and Eve were perfect for each other. They were not only able to be part of the same group as a husband and wife, but they could share their lives together. And God did that. God did that for those two individuals. But He also did something in relation to children. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, notice what it says. Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. How did Adam and Eve have this child? God gave it to them. And so God, family is important because God is involved in bringing us together. Not just a sense of belonging but a sense of sharing some special things, special relationships. Family is important in that regard. And so we cannot minimize the importance of family. And so what about this commandment? Well, there are some things that I want us to observe about this commandment. The first thing is the difference between the audiences. When you read Deuteronomy's account, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and make sure I get this right, verse 16, uh, Moses adds something that we don't find in Deuteronomy chapter 20. He adds this phrase, 
The Lord God commanded you as the Lord God commanded you. Now, there are no translational difficulties in this text. There are no major thematic differences in this text that lead to the addition of this phrase in Deuteronomy as it's not presented in Exodus chapter 20. The difference here is the audiences. Think about the audience in Exodus chapter 20. The audience in Exodus chapter 20 are, they are days removed from the Exodus from the land of Egypt. It just happened, literally. And so as God is giving them this commandment, he's giving this Exodus audience the commandment for the very first time. And so they're hearing it as something that needs to be obeyed in the future. It's not that they could neglect and, and, and mistreat their kids and stuff before that time. That's not my point. Please don't get that out of that. But as far as it being a strict commandment from God that must be obeyed in this specific way as the Ten Commandments were to be for people in the Old Testament, it was something that was new to them. And so I think there's a principle here that we need to learn from. When is the last time that we were able to tell a child our conversion story? Did we take advantage of that opportunity? Did we tell that child, hey, this is what happened when I obeyed the gospel. When I obeyed the gospel, I went up to the baptistry after church one Sunday morning and there was water there. I didn't expect there to be water there, but hey, there was. And so I turned around and asked Dad, I said, hey, can I be baptized? And he said, well, yeah, you sure can if you believe with all your heart and, and, and that's what you want to do. And so, uh, yes, I do. And we talked for a little bit. We talked for a few minutes to make sure I understand, understood the severity of what I was about to do. And I was baptized into, into Christ at 11 years old on that particular Sunday. That's the way my personal conversion story went. I've never told it to a child before. Not because I haven't had opportunity, but I just didn't take advantage of the opportunity in that way. And so for the Exodus audience, when you're talking about parents in relation to their children, children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Well, what's one of the things that are, that's going to allow children to do that? Because they know their parents' spiritual story. But let's move forward 40 years to a completely different audience. A generation that was not there at the foot of Mount Sinai. They did not hear the commandment originally, but they know what happened in the past. The Deuteronomy audience thought about and knew about the disobedience of the previous generation. And so what Moses is doing as he's giving this phrase here in Deuteronomy that's not given in Exodus is saying, hey, I don't just want you to think about this in relation to the future. Think about this in relation to the past and the previous generation as well. Somebody dropped the ball. Their parents stopped teaching their children the things that they needed to know. And so, in large respect, that's what led to them being disobedient and not being able to enter into the promised land. Moses said, I want you to think about that, but also think about it in relation to the future. When you cross over into the land of Canaan, there's also things that need to be taught to your children. Don't neglect that. And so there's an application here as well, not just the conversion story that we are able to tell, but the experiences from our spiritual life that we are able to share with people that may be younger than us. We learn things over time, don't we? If I've been a Christian for any uh, concept of time, any frame of time at all, I've learned some things, I've made some mistakes, and hopefully I've grown and learned some experience from those things. Those also need to be used as teaching tools for younger people. And so when Moses describes this commandment, there are two different audiences being described, but the application is very much the same, but there are also some things that may be a little bit different from the Deuteronomy audience versus the Exodus audience. But it all comes back to this concept, family is important. 
There are two more things that I want us to talk about this morning briefly in relation to this commandment. I've got both of them on the screen here. I want us to look at balance when it comes to this commandment and also abuse when it comes to this commandment. I'll explain what I mean by these as I get to them. When we think about balance in relation to this commandment, it's important for us to recognize what the New Testament says about this as well. If you'll go to Ephesians chapter 6, this is the, the text that um, Keith just read for us a few minutes ago. And it has something to do with both parents and children. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let's talk about the parents first of all. Let's remind ourselves of some previous commandments that we've talked about. Let's talk about the monotheism commandments. Let's talk about the Sabbath commandments. Uh, these are commandments that are going to make Israel unique. We've talked about that. But what about the children? What happens when the children begin to learn, hey, we are so radically different from everybody else around us? Do children like that very much? Do they like being the ones that are different from everybody else? I didn't when I was a kid. I didn't like being the one that wore different shoes or wore different clothes. Uh, when mom and dad came to pick me up when I was in elementary school, they came to pick me up in this ugly blue van that was about three different shades of blue. The wheels were supposed to be white, and I said that correctly. They were supposed to be white. They were not, but they were supposed to be. They had this, it had this big dent on the side of it, and it was embarrassing. You could see an entire line of cars. Which one stuck out? Our blue van. I hated getting picked up in that thing because everybody else, they may have had a nice vehicle. But everybody, I could feel everybody looking at me, smirking, making fun of me as I got into this blue van. I hated being different in that regard. Children don't like being different from everybody else. But let's take it up a notch. And let's think about religion. What happens when kids recognize that all of their friends do things completely differently than they do? They go to a different church. That church that they go, go to teaches different things than they do. And they are the only ones virtually in their inner circle of friends that does things differently. What does that generate? Well, in many respects, it generates questions. And so as parents, what do we do when they come asking those questions? Or simply just as a person that has a relationship with an older person. You might not have a, a child that small to have this conversation with today, but hopefully, as I mentioned earlier, you will have opportunities to talk to children about these things. What do we do whenever they come asking those questions? Sometimes I think what we want to do, let's just say it's a 16, 17-year-old person, and they come to you and they say, you know what, I don't know if I believe in God anymore. What? And we automatically get defensive. And we're like, what do you mean you don't believe in God anymore? We've raised you different than that. We've brought you to church ever since, ever since you were born. You ought to be rock solid in your faith by this point. D forget about all of that. God exists. Just don't ask it again. And we get upset and mad. Does that do any good? What ought we to do? Look at what Paul says in verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. When kids come asking questions like that, we ought to have a smile on our face. And that might surprise some of you to hear me say that. They don't believe in God? They're questioning their faith? You want me to smile about it? Yes. And the reason we ought to smile about it is because, number one, they're asking because they want to believe in God. They want to know the truth. They want to have a solid foundation in their faith or they wouldn't be asking those questions to begin with. 
And the second reason we need to smile is because they're asking the right person. They respect us as a guardian or a parent or anyone, just strictly an adult. When, parent, when kids question their faith and they ask questions about it, they want to know more, it is a good thing. And so the way we respond matters. We don't beat them over the head with religion and with our theology. We simply be prepared to give a biblical, solid, foundational answer because we want them to grow in their faith. It's the parent side of things, but what about the kids' side of things? We talked about the questions that may be answered or may be asked. I think that word may is important. Sometimes people have questions about their faith, but they, have, they, they, they don't really ask them. They keep them inside of them, and they choose not to ask them instead. And when they have questions that they don't ask and they don't have answers for, they get upset. Sometimes they get angry. Sometimes their emotions run high, and sometimes it leads to a lot of spiritual problems in their life because they're just simply not willing to ask the questions that need to be asked. So as parents, we think about the, the, the children and what they may ask us and the way that we respond. I want to take the concept of this commandment. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Let's switch it around. Parents, honor your children. Elderly, honor the younger generation. That may sound weird to us, and what I don't mean is I don't let them do whatever they want to do. I don't approve of everything that they would like to do, regardless of whether it's right or not. That's not what I mean by honor. What I mean by honor is providing them the spiritual foundation that they need to grow spiritually as they grow physically. Matthew chapter 10 Jesus says something that I think is very important and I think is relatable to what we're talking about here today. In Matthew 10, verse 37, Jesus says this. He says, Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What do I mean when I say, make sure that parents, you honor your children and not just make your children honor you because it's more than obedience. Par uh, children can obey their parents but not honor them. There's a difference in obeying and honoring. You can obey in spite of somebody just because they have authority over you. But then when you're not under that household anymore, you go and do whatever you want to do. That's not honoring. Children obeying their parents and children honoring their parents sometimes can mean two different things. And so what do I mean by making sure that we honor our children, bringing them up the way that, we need, the way that they need to be brought up? What I mean is this. When I raise my child or when I influence another child, whether they're my child or not, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make sure that as that child grows up, they love Jesus more than they love me. I want Lane and Jada to love Jesus more than they love me. I want them to, to honor Jesus more than they honor me. It's not about obeying me. It's about obeying God. Because when that foundation is laid, and when that level of obedience and honor is laid, when they leave the nest, as we like to say, they'll understand the type of person that they are supposed to be. That's what it means for children to honor their parents and for parents to honor their children. When both sides of the equation is doing what needs to be done. It's not just about the children. It's about the parents too. But what about abuse? When I say abuse here, I don't mean verbal abuse. I don't mean physical abuse. What I mean is simply misusing this commandment. Doing things with it that God never meant 
to be done. We talked about the importance of family. And when you think about the importance of family, we find in Scripture that faith and family need to go together. Sometimes that doesn't always happen. Sometimes it's very different depending on the household. But faith and family, as best we can allow it to happen, needs to go together. I thought about Cornelius' household, and I'll just read these, uh, these, uh, uh, this passage quickly because I think it provides a valid point that needs to be understood. Uh, this is where um, God came to Cornelius and told Cornelius to go and get Peter. Peter's got something that he's going to tell you that's very important. So Cornelius sends some servants from his household to go get Peter. Peter and some others come back, and it says in verse 24, On the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Skip down to verse 33. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Cornelius learned that God's got some really important things that, um, uh, that Peter is going to tell him, but he doesn't want to be the only one there to hear it because he wants faith and family to go together. And so they all hear it together. How many families do you know that are broken religiously? The husband goes to church here. The wife goes to church here. The husband believes this, the wife believes this. How in the world can that family function the way God wants it to function? Faith and family has to go together. It can't be separated and the household honor and obey God the way that it needs to. But also, let's look at an example from the scribes and the Pharisees. Mark chapter 7 in Mark chapter 7, Jesus confronts the scribes and the Pharisees that are uh, they're big on their traditions, but they're light on God's commandments. And, and Jesus says, Well did Isaiah prophesy, I'm reading verse 6 here, of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And then he goes on to say, You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. But Jesus is going to elaborate on this and why this is such warped theology. What commandment are they breaking? He gives a specific example, verse 9. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God, Jesus says, in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. What's the tradition? The tradition is for the scribes and the Pharisees to say, uh, it's okay if we put more money into the treasury than we give to our parents to help them live a better life, then that's okay. That's what your tradition says. God never said that. And so what they're doing when their parents come to need something, oh, we can't help you. All of our money's tied up in the temple of the Lord, in the treasury of the Lord. We can't do it. Jesus rebukes them because that's not honoring your father and your mother. And by the way, who's he talking to? He's talking to adults. I don't stop honoring my father and my mother just because I don't live with them anymore. Because the principle still remains. It's about loving Jesus, loving God, more than you do your parents. And when that happens, we could say this about so many different things, but when that happens, what does everything else do? It falls into place. In some ways, this commandment may be the most consequential commandment in these list of ten. You know why? 
Because generally speaking, children outlive their parents by a long shot. And so the parents ought to still be seen in the way that their kids live. If indeed children are obeying their parents and they're honoring their father and their mother. But there are heavy consequences to this commandment. Future spiritual generations rise and fall based on this commandment. So my question for you today is, you may not have small children, and that's okay. But I want to leave this on the table, generally speaking. What are we doing to leave a good, solid spiritual legacy for children in general? Not just our kids, but children in general. I love going to church at Covington because they've done so much for me and my family. My dad has preached there for, over, for, for about 20 years there now. But from the first day we stepped foot in that auditorium when I was, I guess, a sophomore in high school till now, the same one man has virtually every child in the congregation run up to him and ask him for a piece of candy. They call him the candy man. Those children might not remember a whole lot, whole lot from their childhood experience at church, but I promise you this. They will remember that guy that was always willing to give them candy and never missed a service and never stopped thinking about how important that piece of candy was for children. Hopefully that candy will stop being physical candy and spiritual candy later on down the road, if you understand what I mean. But it comes all back to this legacy that we're leaving for children to make sure that they honor God more than they honor any human being on earth. If you're here this morning and you need to respond to the invitation, you have the opportunity to do so. It may be that you have thwarted this commandment. You have not been honoring anybody, let alone children, the way that you ought to, and you want to ask for prayers and you want to be restored today. Take the opportunity to do that. It may be that you're here today and you want to learn more about the church. What is Christian living all about? What is the church? How do I become a part of it? Those are good questions. And all the answers are found right here in the Bible. Ask those questions today. Let us help you find the answers. Let us all glorify God the way that we are supposed to. If you're here this morning and you need to respond for any reason, please do so as we stand and sing.